in the 15th century, the English nobility was divided over who should be king, and had split into two factions, the houses of York and Lancaster. Many great battles were fought in what we now call the War of the Roses, but one battle would see the death of the infamous Kingmaker and secure the throne for the House of York. This is the Battle of Barnet. The Yorkist Edward IV had seized the English throne from the Lancastrian King Henry VI, who was captured in 1465 and imprisoned in the Tower of London. His wife, Margaret of Anjou, and their son, Edward of Westminster, had fled to Scotland and organised an uprising against the Yorkists. Edward IV crushed the uprising and pressured the Scottish government to force Margaret out. As a result, the House of Lancaster then went into exile in France. To tighten his grip on the throne, Edward rewarded his supporters, including his chief adviser Richard Neville, the 16th Earl of Warwick, elevating them to higher titles and rewarding them land confiscated from their defeated foes. But Warwick grew to disapprove of the King's rule, and their relationship became growingly strained. The reason for this strain was that Warwick had planned for Edward to marry a French princess, Bonner of Savoy, sister-in-law to Louis XI of France, to create an alliance between the two countries. Edward, however, favoured ties with Burgundy, and in 1464 further angered Warwick by secretly marrying Elizabeth Woodville, an impoverished Lancastrian widow, who was regarded by the Yorkists as an unacceptable queen. Edward, ignoring Warwick's discontent, bestowed gifts of lands and titles on Elizabeth's relations, and arranged marriages to rich and powerful families. Infuriated by these acts, Warwick decided the Woodvilles were an evil influence on the king. He felt sidelined, and his influence over the king was failing, and he decided to take drastic action to force Edward's compliance. Warwick's alternative plan was to replace the king with his fellow conspirator, the Duke of Clarence, Edward's younger brother. Instigating several rebellions in the north, Warwick lured the king away from his main bastion of support in the south. Edward found himself outnumbered. While retreating, he learned that Warwick and Clarence had called for open support of their rebellion. After winning the Battle of Edgecote on the 26th of July 1469, the Earl found the Yorkist King deserted by his followers and brought him to Warwick Castle for his so-called protection. Lancastrian supporters were quick to take advantage of Edward's imprisonment and staged multiple uprisings. Because most Yorkist commanders refused to rally to Warwick's call, the Earl was pressured to release the King. Back in power, Edward did not openly pursue Warwick's transgressions against him, but the Earl suspected that the King held a grudge. Warwick engineered another rebellion, along with Edward's brother, George, Duke of Clarence. The two conspirators, however, had to flee to France when Edward crushed the uprising at the Battle of Loosecote Field on the 12th of March, 1470. In a deal brokered with the French King Louis XI, Warwick agreed to serve Margaret of Anjou and the Lancastrian cause. Warwick then invaded England at the head of a Lancastrian army and, in October 1470, forced Edward to seek refuge in Burgundy. The throne of England was then temporarily restored to Henry VI and Warwick became known as the Kingmaker. But Edward would not simply just give up on the throne and on the 14th of March 1471 he brought an army back across the English Channel, landing at Ravensburn. Edward marched inland towards York, gathering men as he went. His march was unopposed at the beginning because Edward was moving through lands that belonged to the Percys and the Earl of Northumberland, who were indebted to the Yorkist King for the return of their northern territories. Furthermore, Edward announced that he was returning only to claim his father's title of Duke of York and not to contest the English crown. 
This ruse was successful. Montague, who was monitoring Edward's march, could not convince his men to move against the Yorkist king. Once Edward's force had gathered sufficient strength, he dropped the ruse and headed south towards London. Edward IV was an imposing character, standing some six feet three inches tall. He was an inspiring figure in combat, attacking his foes while wearing a suit of golden armour. Medieval texts described the king as handsome, finely muscled and with a broad chest. Edward was a capable tactician and leader in battle. He frequently spotted and exploited defensive frailties in enemy lines, often with decisive results, and by 1471 he was a highly respected field commander. The Earl of Warwick himself had fought for the House of York since the early stages of the Wars of the Roses, and alongside his cousin Edward IV. His years of loyalty earned him the trust of the Yorkist, and his victories, both political and military, made him an important figure at the royal court. Early historians described him as a military genius, but a more modern review of his tactical acumen was reconsidered to the fact that the Earl largely owed some of his victories to being in the right place at the right time. The two armies met on the foggy morning of the 14th of April 1471. Warwick's army heavily outnumbered Edward's, although sources differ on exact numbers. Lancastrian strength ranges from 10,000 to 30,000 men, with the Yorkists at 7,000 to 15,000. Recognising that he was at a disadvantage, Edward planned for an early attack and quickly roused his men to engage the Lancastrians. The morning fog was thick, and the knights' movements of the two forces had displaced them laterally with each other. Neither army was facing the other, each was offset slightly to the right. This displacement meant that the right end of either army could outflank the other by wrapping around the opposing left end. Both sides fired their cannons and arrows before laying into each other with pole arms. The Lancastrians were the first to exploit this advantage. Oxford's battle quickly overwhelmed Hastings. Yorkist soldiers fled towards Barnet, chased all the way by the Lancastrians. Some of Hastings' men even reached London, spreading tales of the fall of York and a Lancastrian victory. Oxford's battle disintegrated as they split off to loot the fallen enemies and plunder Barnet. Yelling and chasing after his men, Oxford rallied 800 of them and led them back into the battle. Due to the fog, visibility was low and the two main forces failed to notice Oxford's victory over Hastings. This meant that the collapse of the Yorkist left wing had little effect on morale of either side. The fighting between Montague and Edward's battles was evenly matched and intense, with neither side able to get the upper hand. However, the Lancastrian left wing was suffering treatment like that of which Oxford had inflicted upon its counterpart. Gloucester exploited the misaligned forces and beat Exeter back. Progress for Edward's brother was slow because his battle was fighting up a slight slope. Nevertheless, the pressure he exerted on the Lancastrian left wing rotated the entire battle line. Warwick, seeing the shift, ordered most of his reserves to help ease the pressure on Exeter and took the rest into fighting at the centre. Oxford was able to retrace his steps through the fog back to the fight. His battle arrived unexpectedly at Montague's rear. Obscured by the fog, Oxford's star with raised badge was mistaken by Montague's men for Edward's son in splendour. They assumed their allies were Edward's reserves and unleashed a volley of arrows. Oxford and his men immediately cried treachery. As staunch Lancastrians, they were wary of Montague's recent defection. They struck back and began withdrawing from the battle. Their shouts of treason were taken up and spread quickly throughout the Lancastrian line, breaking it apart as men fled in anger, panic and confusion. As the fog began to thin, Edward saw the Lancastrian centre in disarray 
and sent in its reserves, hastening its collapse. Cries of Exeter's demise from a Yorkist axe resounded across the battlefield from the Lancastrian left, and amidst the confusion, Montague was struck in his back and killed by either a Yorkist or one of Oxford's men. Witnessing his brother's death, Warwick knew the battle was lost. He made for the horses in an attempt to retreat. Edward recognised his victory was at hand, and deciding that Warwick was more valuable alive than dead, sent the order and dispatched his guard to bring him back alive. However, Warwick died in the Lancastrian rout. When fleeing the field, he was struck off his horse and killed. The battle lasted from two to three hours and was over by the time the fog completely lifted in the early morning. As usual in most battles of the time, the routed army suffered far more casualties as fleeing men were cut down from behind. Contemporary sources give various casualty figures. The Great Chronicle of London reports 1,500 dead, whereas the Warksworth Chronicle states 4,000. 16th century chroniclers say at least 10,000 men died in battle. Warwick had been such an influential figure in the 15th century English politics that, on his death, no one matched him in terms of power and popularity. Deprived of Warwick's support, the Lancastrians suffered their final defeat at the Battle of Tewkesbury on the 4th of May, which marked the end of the reign of Henry VI and the restoration of the House of York. <laughs>